Hi, I'm Dan Fairley. I'm a minister at Bethel Church in Redding, California. I'm the dean of our Supernatural School of Ministry, and we're here talking some theology and just get a chance to spend some time together yep. and talk through some of the, uh, the things we're learning, uh, the things we're wondering about, <laughs> and then also just to realize we're part of a larger conversation that the church has been having for 2,000 years, yeah. and the, the followers of Yahweh for longer than that, <laughs> about who God is, what he's up to, what his heart is for us, what his heart is for humanity. Exactly. And so we thought we'd spend exactly. some time, um, you know, speaking about those things. I love it. Yeah. Well, let's see, we've uh, known each other, I don't know, I knew of you before you knew of me, perhaps. Uh, but yeah. uh, since 91, <clears throat> I, I came to Reading, uh, just finishing right. up uh, Bible school in San Francisco at Simpson uh, college at that point. And then I was down at Fuller Seminary in uh, Pasadena. Yeah. Got my MDiv down there. And I got called to be a minister up here uh, at Reading, uh, the college pastor. And then I knew you were up in Weaverville. Yeah. Yep. yep and so yep. how long were you in Weaverville before oh, you came to Bethel? And We were there 17 years. I was on staff at Bethel with my dad for five years. And then he and the eldership sent us up to uh, a daughter church of theirs in Weaverville. And we were there for 17 and then the eldership asked us to come back uh, to the mother church in the end of 95. We came in the beginning of 96. Beautiful. So, And we're yeah. part of a, a church that's been around for almost 60 years or so, yeah. right? It was, yeah. a, uh, it, uh, was, was it part of the assemblies at, at the very beginning? I, I believe it started in yeah. the assemblies. And it was until, I don't know, 12 years or so ago. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. And so yeah. I, if I remember the story right, it was a kind of a, a church split as, a, you know, it's scandalous, but most church growth happens through church splits. <laughs> Bummer. <laughs> Not ideal, but uh, <laughs> certainly that happens. And then uh, for a while, it was it, an independent work uh, in, in the late 50s. And then it came back into the assemblies at, at some particular time. And then when the Lord was moving on Bethel uh, to kind of create networks and um, uh, to have a, uh, it felt like we were trying to do something in somebody else's house. Yeah. Um, uh, to, to do what we were got called to do within the assemblies. And so that's the time that we uh, moved out yeah. of the assemblies. Yeah, we, we basically asked permission to leave. But, yeah. you know, our relationship with them was good, Absolutely. and it still is. I mean, we just, uh, we really feel indebted to them. In fact, we, we give the same, yeah. you know, the financial support that we gave when we were in the assemblies. We do now. I mean, yeah. nothing in that sense has changed. But... But it's it, it's difficult to experiment the way we experiment with things uh, that causes problems for other people, and we just yeah. felt it was wisdom to 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 leave as honorably as we knew how, but yeah. still keep connections, and and so that's what we've tried to do. So we've worked hard to do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so, it, and the Holy Spirit was hitting in unusual ways at that time, and yeah. so that was kind of difficult for the vineyard to navigate, for yeah. the the assemblies to navigate, True. and so. Uh, but, we don't say that to be critical, but it's just part of, we love <laughs> the global church of of oh, Jesus. I, I do. And um, it yeah. feels, uh, I get grieved when I hear somebody attacking another believer. Uh, I get, you know, concerned when I hear somebody like, I, I know your motives. Uh, it's like, ah, really? Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's not ideal. And so the, um, uh, the, the value for the church, I think, is absolutely central to who we are and what we're doing. Like I, I call the Assemblies of God. I wasn't raised in them, but my pastor had left that denomination and was, uh, you know, it was kind of, that was where his roots. Um, but I call them the, dr the dread champions of the Lord. I mean, in some ways for the last hundred years, they've been doing an amazing work oh, so, for King so, Jesus. Yeah, Just right. gorgeous work for King <clears throat> Jesus. You're right. so, some of the godliest people I've ever met are in the assembly. Some of the most courageous people I've yeah. ever met. Some of the boldest, faith-filled people. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I live indebted. Very thankful. Beautiful. And so let's yeah. just talk about like your love for the, <clears throat> the church in general, not just our particular slice of it. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I, I, I really do. I was, <clears throat> excuse me, I was raised in a household uh, that really valued the body of Christ, period. Uh, my dad was such a, such a, a champion of of diversity. No, we say body of Christ. It's people who have put their faith in Jesus. Exactly. Yeah. All, and people who are born again or yeah. are part of this this thing called the body of Christ, the yeah. church of the living God. Yeah. And uh, and my dad was such a champion of diversity. Uh, you know, you, you hear the phrase, uh, people will say, I want to be celebrated, not tolerated. Yeah. And and he was he, he lived that. I mean, mm -hmm. he really, really loved the diversity. He didn't tolerate it. He loved it. 
and uh, and he would bring people in to minister to us here at Bethel. I'll never forget the diversity of people, but they all had this love for God. They all had a prayer life. They all had this affection for Jesus. They all were worshipers. They all loved the scriptures, and they had all these things in common. And, uh, and they would come and minister to us here at Bethel when, when my dad was the senior leader. So I, I learned that from him. And in fact, to illustrate the diversity, one Sunday morning, he had a Catholic priest come and speak at this Assembly of God Church. And the very next Sunday, a Baptist evangelist. Wow. And yeah. so that's about as diverse as you know as you can get i mean it really taught us because people responded so well we could see what the priest had to say that was so powerful for us and the baptist evangelist and and on and on it goes but a real celebration absolutely yeah in fact my my dad there was a a pastor friend of his here in town that he had uh, breakfast or lunch with uh, one day and and the pastor uh, was from a, a denomination that didn't believe quite the same as we did regarding the Holy Spirit. And he, he made a comment to my dad. He said, you guys call yourself full gospel. And he said, I, I really, that really hurts when you say that because it implies you have the full gospel and we have part gospel. And my dad looked at him and said, I'll never use that term again. And wow. he, he dropped it there. He would never use that term again. It, it's well, meaningful. He had, and he had full gospel fellowship guys in his church. Oh, oh, oh totally. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Made it tough to make announcements. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he never used that to describe himself versus another group. It, it, it's kind of an elite term. I don't think it started that way. No, but, I, no. you know, it, it wasn't, it's not a competition. But it ends up that way. You know, well, we have something you don't have. And there's this arrogance thing. And, and he was such a champion at at valuing what a person had. So Beautiful. I, yeah, the, I love that. Talking about that elite thing, we ran into that with our core values at some point, trying to not, at one point we were calling them apostolic distinctions, you know, <laughs> and it's like, yeah, it works, but uh, it did feel like it was drawing lines and fences that weren't in our heart, that yeah. actually isn't in our theology, saying these are our distinctives, uh, but actually we started calling them, these are our emphasis, the things the Lord's taught us to emphasize yeah. um, on t in the global church. Realizing that the Lord in his genius beauty <laughs> is calling other denominations, other works to emphasize other things to his glory. Yeah, and yeah, uh, that's true. He's a, a gloriously, you know, gigantic <clears throat> God. He takes a full fellowship in order to accurately reflect who he is and what he cares about. That's true. There's many tribes in the nation, yeah. and uh, each one contributes. And I, uh, one of the things I enjoy so much with the travel uh, that I do, I, I travel a fair amount of the year, is I'm with uh, so many different groups that are so different mm -hmm. than we are. Mm -hmm. But they'll take the risk, you know, and, and ask me to come. And, and, uh, and I, I love being with them so much. I love, I love even hearing a teaching that in, maybe in some measure contradicts something that I hold dear. Mm -hmm. Uh, obviously, if it's absolutely against Scripture, then yeah. then I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna struggle. If there's like a zillion gods or something like that, yeah, 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 yeah like, exactly. Like yeah. <laughs> but but if you know if it's uh, you know I hear somebody uh, I have a friend teach on Calvinism and uh, predestination when I would emphasize free will. I love hearing that. I, I really do. It doesn't offend me at all. It, it awakens me to uh, to the, not only the rest of the church but the part of the scriptures I'm, I that may not stand out to me. Yeah, and uh, and I I really enjoy that journey of walking with other people. Absolutely. So fun. It's just, you know, when we're doing our uh, our membership class, our deeper life class, we talk about every Christian has a Holy Spirit. Yes. You can't be a Christian without the Holy Spirit. He's exactly. the, the, in the seal of our salvation, the spirit of adoption by which we cry out, Abba, Father. Exactly. And so when whenever we're making odd distinctions as far as a full gospel or not, or charismatic or not, or <clears throat> and we sound like we're... Uh, we're drawing these lines against each other based on the Holy Spirit or, yeah. or our interpretation of Scripture. Again, not when it's not when it's the majors, but when it's in the minors. Yep. Um, I think that it's 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 uh, painful to experience, and I think you know it creates a dissonance and an unclear message. I mean, I was reading again John 17 and Jesus's love of the unity of the church. Like yeah. he's like this will actually be gorgeous. <laughs> A billboard saying, I yeah. am who I am. Yeah. Like our unity 
and our love for each other in the midst of these disagreements and things. We know the apostles were trying to figure out, like, do, do I have to be a Jew in order to be a Christian? And that take yeah. finally they have a council 14 years later, like, no, you don't have to be circumcised. Who to thunk it? You know, they're yeah, yeah. they're trying to walk through what is the meaning of this this connection with Jesus. Yeah, exactly. And so, and Jesus on, on the night he's betrayed is like, it's the unity, guys. It's the unity and the love. So that, that's going to be a message to the world of who I am. Yep. And that I accomplished what I said I would accomplish in yep. creating a body, a, a family. Yep. So yeah. it, we got to do everything we can to celebrate that. The, yeah. And that's the point is we do celebrate. We don't, we can't create unity. You know, there's a lot of unity movements trying to create unity. Paul says in Ephesians 4, to preserve the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. So when the Holy Spirit has true influence over my life, I'm going to live without offense as somebody who thinks differently than I do. And it's the it's that measure of his influence on how I think, yeah. how I see, how I value another person. It doesn't mean uh, our differences disappear. No. It just means our value for one another. Uh, you know, there's that conviction of you as a as a a, a person the Holy Spirit dwells in, mm -hmm. I've got to value that. Yeah. I have to treat with great respect that fellow believer. And, and that's that's the whole thing, preserve the unity of the Spirit. In fact, in John 17, he says, I gave them my glory. That's the manifested presence of Jesus. Yeah. Wow. I gave them my glory that they might be one. Yeah. So the whole concept of us being united together is the result of his presence. Yeah. It's not the result of some ecumenical movement. I don't mind not those, through, but that's... Not the perfect agreement, or you no. got to lay down anything offensive, and as soon as you and I, as soon as you think like me, we can actually walk together. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. What do we do? That's not <laughs> unity, that uniformity. <laughs> yeah. You, real unity, I, I believe, requires diversity. Mm. It's, it's the only way you can really tell that you have unity. Otherwise, it's everybody's, you know, it's the cookie cutter Christian where we all look and talk the same. That's not good for us. Yeah. It's not good for, It's not good for me just to be, to be around people who agree with me. Yeah. It's just not healthy. I, I need, you know, the rock tumbler, you know, where the sharp yeah. edges of the yeah. rock, we, we, we're together. And it helps to bring that glory of, of Christ out of our lives through, yeah. our, through our fellowship together. So, so I often <laughs> wonder, like, in, you know, Am I going to get to heaven? What am I going to find out I had wrong when I get to heaven? I mean, do, you ever, yeah. do you ever have that thought? Like, oh, oh, oh yeah, uh, oh yeah. <laughs> it's going to be a, an awakening. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it's it's interesting when you think if you play that through, you're like, is it? Am I going to have spiritual pride? Like, oh yeah, I got that one right. Like, you know, I'm in heaven, like right, keeping right, a tally right. of what I had right versus right. somebody else. I'm like, oh no, I, I hope not. I hope that's all killed in me. Yeah. Uh, you know, before I get into the <laughs> presence so of funny. the Lord. That's so but funny. if you're, if you can take joy in each other, you're like, well, you guys really nailed that. Like we. Yeah, did not have great. that right. <laughs> you had that super right, you know. Um, I like that. And so I, I, that thing, when the expectation like of delight yeah. in how my sister or my brother yeah. really articulated it so much closer, more accurately than I was able to understand. Like, I, I expect that to be part of the joy of heaven uh, as I'm trying, you know, beginning to understand who God is. But do you have that, I, that same deal? That I, I like that. <laughs> yeah. I do. I like that. I, 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 I live with the awareness that he's going to adjust things that I think when I get there. Yeah. That, you know, I, there's nothing that I'm thinking that I know is wrong. Right. Or yeah, I, well or, said. Or yeah, we're change. not trying to purposely be inaccurate ever. Exactly. Like we're trying to be as exactly. the best articulation of who God is, what he's up to, that we can. But who gets but, it all right? Totally. You know, let's be honest. Who gets it all right? We, we've got to live with the realization, man, I am going to try my best. Yeah. I'm going to stay yeah. open before the Lord. I'm going to stay open before my brothers, my sisters. But I, I, I walk delicately because I, I know he's going to adjust things in me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm praying he does that now. But, uh, yeah. but, I, but I, you know, to be honest, I don't expect to have arrived by the time I no, die. No, me neither. I, yeah. And I'm, it, I'm, I'm often just, it strikes me, it's the cults who want uniformity and perfect articulation that you must agree with or you're out. That's, that's true. It, and right. it's not usually the Christian church. Actually, it is the Christian church a little bit, but... <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> in the sense of separating it. Since, the, uh, since we first separated back in 1000, the, the Orthodox Church and the, yeah, the Catholic yeah. Church, and then in the 1500s, uh, you know, we've been kind of separating ever since, uh, tragically. Yeah. Um, uh, sometimes for good reasons. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, maybe becoming those stones who are sharpening and, right. and bringing us right. into new places in some ways. But uh, that, that deal that demands that we all have group think is... Um, it's, it's, in the majors, Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man. The yeah, scriptures are yeah. the authoritative word about it. In those, but in the rest, there needs to be a lot of 
a lot, lot of, of liberty lot of and a lot of grace for each other. You know, I, 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 have, I have friends that think so different from me. And we have, you know, when you, when you have favor with one another, you can have a conversation that's actually enjoyable about something you disagree with. You know, it's, it's not, I'm going to die on this mountain and I'm going to kill you in the process. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. not that. When and, you know I won't abandon you if you think different. Like, that's just, yeah, that's not on the table. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And what I find is that sometimes... I'll see in another person why they think the way they do. Mm-hmm. You know, their upbringing, they were trained in this way of thinking. And then I realized, oh, I was trained in a certain way of thinking. And hopefully, much of it is biblical. But in the journey, you find that, oh, man, I've lived with this conviction for 40 years, and I'm just finding out the Bible doesn't say that at all. Mm-hmm. And, uh, mm-hmm. and that's, that's mm-hmm. part of the joy of this journey with Christ, but with one another. Absolutely. Yeah. So... How do you kind of generally think about theology? Because we have we do have some differences with people we consider fellow Christians. Like the, the Catholics would feel that the Pope speaks for the Lord, right, you know, right. um, uh, ex cathedra, uh, and the, that that becomes doctrine. You know, we would be no, uh, he he's one of the speakers for the Lord. <laughs> right, right. You know, so am I. So are other people. Uh, Sometimes I wonder, like, well, that's a different discussion. But the, <laughs> how do you think through theology in this big sense? We've we've already been talking about it a little bit, but how do you think through tame your heart? What core values do you bring to this discussion of theology uh, that helps shape the way you have these dialogues? Well, theology is is, is huge. It's critical. It's 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 what God thinks. It's yeah. it's what is true. Yeah. And we have this lifelong journey. <laughs> to read and to study, immerse ourselves into this book so that we see what he thinks. Yeah. That's that's what I want to know. I, I'm not trying to find information to argue against you or yeah. the guy down the road. I'm I'm trying to find the stuff that changes me. It's it's gotta work in me to make me more like Jesus. Yeah. If it doesn't, then I question if I see clearly, mm-hmm. you know, because mm-hmm. it's 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 really Truth sets you free, which means I'm going to acknowledge it's true. I'm going to repent my way into that reality, into that truth, until what he has said is seen in how I think, how I, uh, my ambition, my words, my lifestyle. Everything is adjusted to what he has said in his word. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's, it's uh, I, uh, you, we've had these conversations before uh, about the study of scripture. I, I don't study so that I have a sermon. Mm-hmm. I don't want to do that. I don't want to try to find something so I can talk to a crowd of people. I want to find something that impacts me. Yeah. And so I, I will underline, I mark that verse. I you know, make the cross references. Yeah. I, I do whatever I need to do. But again, not so that I have a beautiful outline for Sunday. I may, We had a series a while back on wisdom. I actually sat on it for 10 years until I felt the liberty to talk about it because I want it to distill in me mm-hmm. until it's affected me affected me in every area that I know how to have it affect me so that when I speak on a subject, I'm speaking out of my own journey. I'm not speaking out of a subject I read in a textbook somewhere mm-hmm. or, or somebody else's book. Those things are fine. They're good for discussion, but not not when you're, when a, as a pastor, you're trying to disciple and lead a group of people. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, it's huge, but it's, it's first, it's got to change me. First, you know, the theology has to change me. It has to change how I perceive him, how I respond to him, how I serve him, how I obey him, how I represent him. All those things have to be impacted by what I see in here. If it doesn't, then I need to take another look at what I've, what I've read. And so you, is it accurate to say like you take the fierceness or the, Take the, the 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 edge of the sword of the spirit, and you you want to have it internally aimed at you, way uh, before it heads absolutely. towards anybody else, and absolutely. that you're expecting that to, that transformation to happen. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I had a friend who years ago he, he had a sermon titled "Walking Through the Sword," mm-hmm. and and the picture was a, a sword aimed right at you. Here's the tip, mm-hmm. and then the Lord says, "Come here." Yeah. You know, you, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's delightful. It's, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but it, but it really is. It's yeah. it's it's the welcoming, it's the welcoming of the word of the Lord that doesn't just confront. It changes. Mm-hmm. You know, it doesn't just say this is wrong, Bill. Yeah. It empowers a transformation. It's the beauty of that two-edged sword, if you will. It yeah. it heals where it cuts, 
and it and it restores us to a place where where it's not through good works it's it's actually through transformation i think different i see different yeah, yeah. Uh, for me it hits sometimes when i think about how when i when i don't have love for the unbeliever mm. when i don't have love for the lost cuz they think different than me and yeah. they've made my life inconvenience and i'm like <laughs> how could you think that way or or that's, something that's like rough. that yeah. it's it's like, have I has the word really done its work? Because he so loved the world, he sent his son. Wow. Uh, he's, f- f- you know, fanatically in love with the lost and is looking for them. He's the one who says, "I love you, ninety nine, but I've got to go get the wow. one who's not here." Wow. And yet, if I don't have that love for the lost in there, it, it feels like I can have a be really good at sword play. <laughs> Yeah, and and missed his whole heart about who what he cares about and his priority. And again, we don't think he's just saving folks to you know say, okay, you're you're now you stay in the sheep pen. I've got to go out again. But he's actually as a transformation, uh, yes. adopted as his sons and daughters, we become like him. Yeah, we, we're in this incredible family with an ongoing eternal purpose in who he is. But for me, that's one of those places. Like it, huge. it's a an easy place to check my heart when I start getting really uh, angry and frustrated with either Christians or non-Christians. I'm like, I, I probably need to read my Bible some more. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but you can find that in the yeah, Psalms. But this is, let's talk, you can find some of that in the Psalms and stuff, but we see in Jesus no. this love of enemies yeah. who from the cross says, Father, forgive them. Um, and so you, we talk about this, we, we have a phrase, Jesus is perfect theology. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I, William Sire, who is the editor of Christianity Today, he said, the fabulous quote, he says, Jesus is the kind of God God is. Oh. Now you got to think about it. I put it on a T-shirt for my singles group. It didn't work because you had to look at the T-shirt too long and it was inappropriate. So I was like, what? So some quotes speak to you, not to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but That's that helped funny. me understand that Jesus is perfect theology. Jesus is the kind of God. You want to know what G- God cares about, yeah. what his priorities are, yeah. what his yeah. when when he's when he's saying, uh, you know, I don't like sin, but I'm not going to prioritize judgment in this moment. You need to see with the woman caught in adultery. Yeah. You need yeah, to yeah. see that who God is in those moments. So you yeah. want to speak to this idea that what do you mean when you're saying Jesus is perfect theology? Well, he is the perfect manifestation of the Father because he's I, God. Because he's eternally God. God yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Let's not mix that it's up. Totally, totally. No, he never stopped being God. Yes. Never took a yeah, vacation. Never God. set it aside. Yeah. No. Eternally God. Yeah. But as as God in the flesh, he illustrates the Father. Yeah. I, I mean, it, you know, is there a greater mystery I, uh, of how Jesus can be 100% God and 100% man, fully God, fully man. I, oh. I don't know. I, I think the church has wrestled with that one for 2,000 yeah, yeah. years because yeah. it's— And we end up basically saying if we overstate it, we might say heresy, yeah. so we just kind of don't overstate it. And yeah. Don't, we're just yeah. hang out here. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, yeah, I don't want to do that. I, yeah. I, I want to stay anchored in the Word, but I don't want to stay anchored— against people's fears or suspicions. I, yeah, yeah. I've, I've got to explore what's possible yeah. in my lifetime. I've got to know. I've got to know. Yeah. I've got to know what's possible in my lifetime by, by following this one mm-hmm. who became a man, mm-hmm. still God, but became yeah. a man to set an example yeah. that could be followed. And he illustrated the Father perfectly. Jesus said it. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Yeah. So in other words, he was saying, you know, Old Testament. I love the Old Testament, by the mm-hmm. way. I, I love the Old Testament. <laughs> But the Old Testament did not reveal God as the Father in the way that Jesus did. No, I think it's only in there, like, there's 16 verses or something in the whole Old yeah. Testament. Yeah, about. and it's what, what was revealed there is powerful, profound, and necessary. Absolutely. But it set the stage for the ultimate revelation. Jesus came, is my conviction, obviously Jesus came to die. Mm-hmm. He came to, uh, you know, to destroy the works of the devil, yes. uh, all, all of that. But he, his his primary purpose in coming, I think, was to reveal the Father. Yeah. He came to reveal something that had never been clearly seen before. So when you see Jesus with the woman caught in adultery, mm-hmm. it's a father-daughter moment. Yeah. Who of us as dads would not do the same thing if our daughter was in trouble? We would stand there with that daughter yeah. against the opposition of the crowd, could care less what anybody thinks, I'm here for my girl. Mm-hmm. I'm here for my girl. And that's what you see yeah. in that moment. You see Jesus representing the Father so powerfully, so purely, so beautifully, not excusing sin, not ignoring, yeah. but still just letting kindness lead to repentance. You know, that's the standard. And that's that's the Father. Jesus yeah. displayed the Father. 
And that, I feel, is our responsibility. Yeah. We, we've got to, to learn how to do the same thing. We've got to somehow find a way to manifest what he's like. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's, that's, that's why we follow this one who is perfect theology. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. He was, uh, absolutely, Jesus came to die for our sins and conquer the power of death, but actually revealing that he is our father yeah. and uh, when, that, that Yahweh is Abba. Yeah. That's revolutionary. And that's a journey like I think all Christians, they'll be delighted if they'll take if they'll take that journey. That the Yahweh of the Old Testament doesn't cease any of those things he is in the Old Testament, the creator, the perfect yes. judge, yes. Uh, truth itself. But that wonderful and wild, Lewis would call him judge <laughs> of the uh, rightful judge of the earth is actually dad. Yeah. That changes everything. 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 Papa God. Mm -hmm. Romans 8, the whole Abba Father thing. Yeah, that's yeah. We, we teach on that that twice Paul had to say um, Abba Pater. So he's, it's written in Greek, but he uses the Aramaic Abba, this kind of term of endearment of, yeah. of, for God as Father, and, and kind of says, I got to use Abba, even though I'm writing to Greek-speaking people in Greek, I can't lose Abba. It it speaks. That's right. That's right. <laughs> it, ha it has that daddy, a certain, the yeah. French would say, a certain je ne sais quoi. Or, you, know, <laughs> you just kind of need the word. And it feels yeah. like that's the way uh, Paul used it, I would say, because that's the way the, ch the church that he was birthed into taught him to pray. Wow. That they taught him to pray. Mm -hmm. Daddy, father. But, you know, not father, because we don't quite mean what the Greek mind thinks about father. They're, you got to have this Aramaic. This, this daddy component, Beautiful. and they go together. Yeah. So that absolutely the primary revela uh, revelation of Jesus, and yeah. I think that's his revolutionary teaching. When you exactly. when you look and say I've, this thread I've seen peeking out of the Old Testament, yeah, I'm actually going to not stop talking about it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to drive you crazy with my dad, my dad, your dad. <laughs> You're like, Whoa. if you call Mama one more time, I'm going to kill you. I mean, in, in yeah. some ways they did. Yeah. Right? They, they did it like your familiarity with God. Yeah, is revolting to us that That's true. We, uh, you know. So that was part of I think what the resistance to his message is. It's like you you are it's not powerful. allowed to think yeah. of God that that familiarly. And wow. Jesus is like yeah yeah I am and so are you. Wow, that's well put. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. So was there anything else you want to add about Jesus being perfect theology though? As far as like uh, as maybe as thinking about healing and and how we think um, about healing. Yeah, I th I think here's my approach, and mm -hmm. I realize there's there's great diversity, and the pe even the people that I that I run with, we mm -hmm. have wonderful conversations. But uh, my approach is that is that Jesus modeled what life could be like for anyone who had no sin mm -hmm. and who was empowered by the Holy Spirit. No sin wow. and empowered by the Holy Spirit, because he 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 became a man. Mm -hmm. Now, if he did all of his miracles as God, obviously, I'm still impressed. I'm not offended. I, yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. there on the sidelines cheering. Yeah. But if I discover he did them as the son of man, mm -hmm. then I realize he has just set a standard that not only can I follow, I must, I must follow. Mm -hmm. I, I cannot stay where mm -hmm. I am. I, I, and I may stink at it my entire life, but I don't have the option, the luxury of lowering his commission to what I'm good at. Yeah. I, yeah. I am compelled to pursue this example that he provided for me. Mm -hmm. And that is a relationship with the Father through the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. a relationship with the Father where he knew what he was to do. You know, he said, I only do what I see my Father yeah. do. I only say what I hear my Father say. So he models a relationship with the Father God, Papa God. Yeah. He models a relationship, and in doing so, picks up mud, puts it on the eye. Yeah. In doing so, tells the woman in adultery, sin no more. Mm -hmm. In doing so, he does all these different things, revealing what he's like. And if he does that, and, and I look at him as, as the ultimate example of theology, revealing yeah. the Father, then I, I owe him the rest of my life to follow that example. Regardless of how successful I am or unsuccessful, I don't have the luxury of changing the standard. Yeah. And we talk about this in the Great Commission, right? Uh, to go and teach them everything I've commanded you. Exactly. You know, baptizing them and teaching them everything I've commanded you. So when we, he commanded the, the, the prayer for the sick and the healing of the sick and the, the, the ongoing relationship with yeah. the Lord and prayer life that is actually somewhat conversational. And, and then uh, in John, as the Father sent me, I send you. Again, I think that's partly the, 
ministry of reconciliation. But in that yep. ministry of reconciliation, sometimes the prophetic word, yep. uh, you know, it happens. Um, uh, the, uh, the the miracle of healing happens, and uh, you know, sometimes it, it, uh, not being healed, you know, happens. You're like, what am I going to do now, God? How, will I follow you still? So that we we in in that moment, we are still inviting people to be reconciled to the Lord, yes. just as he did. And signs and wonders and prophetic words and yep. are all ways yep. of kind of inviting people into that reconciliation that he's that he's longing for. Yeah, exactly. That's right. That's right. We, we owe the world that example. Mm-hmm. We, we owe them our best effort, if I can reduce mm-hmm. it to that. We, we owe them our best attempt at representing him well, making sure that when there's breakthrough, he gets the credit, yeah, not us. Absolutely. And when it doesn't work, I take the responsibility. I, I don't. I don't yeah. accuse him. I don't accuse the people I've ministered to. It's I'm going to take it personally, not in a position of condemnation or mm-hmm. guilt. But you know what? Every time I prayed for someone that was healed, it showed what God could do. Mm-hmm. Every time they weren't healed, it revealed what I can do. Okay. <laughs> And so that's the way you process the yeah. the unanswered prayer in that particular moment, exactly. uh, rather than create a theology uh, based on. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes we think like if the Lord's in it, it'll go perfect. I'm like, hey, what? Have you read Have the you Bible? Read the Bible? <laughs> <laughs> it's not <laughs> like if healing's really from God, everybody get healed. Like no, no. Yeah. I mean, God's really in my marriage, but it ain't perfect. You know, there, it's really in my messages, but it, yeah. the, those messages aren't perfect. Yep, and exactly. there's this odd thing that we apply to healing or prophecy that we don't apply anywhere else. I mean, God's involved in the world for his purposes. It's well put. And it ain't going perfect. Yep. Well put. <laughs> so well I'm not put. sure why that standard's being applied, yeah. you know, yeah. to, to healing. Yeah. yeah. So when I'm reading the Gospel of John, though, so we're talking about Jesus doing miracles is a kind of a an example of the kingdom has come. Mm-hmm. They would draw attention. They would bring people to a point of decision yes. in that moment. Because even if you're healed, it's like, did you go back and thank him? You know, the leper, right? So exactly. he's like, the, the miracle wasn't the thing. It was the relationship. And so the miracle led yeah, to the, yeah. the gratitude mm-hmm. leads to the connection. And so in our heart, the miracle is not the thing. It's a, it's a tool of revealing who God is and then inviting reconciliation and connection. Exactly. Is that... And so I, I would agree with that. I, I do think in, in the way John wrote his gospel, that there he's got those seven signs that he highlights. Right. When I look at those miracles, the way John wrote about them sometimes, I, I think that he's trying to reveal, I am Messiah. I am the anointed one. And I'm not sure the Jewish mind kind of knew that the anointed one was actually the second person of the Trinity. It kind of like we came to understand mm-hmm. the divinity of the Messiah mm-hmm. as Christ unfolded. And the disciples kind of were on that journey too. They're, they're like, that the idea that, Good Jewish boys, monotheists worship Jesus while he's alive, is mind breaking at some level. Yeah, that yeah. they were moved to worship a man whose mama traveled with them, or they knew. Wow, <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. an amazing journey that they're on yeah. when they move are moved to worship Jesus. Yeah. So, but but in John, I think that some of those miracles are they're not just do the same miracles as me, but I am who I am the Messiah you've been looking for. Would would you? Agree with that? That there's yeah. a, a revelation, in, especially in the way oh, John oh, yeah. works on his miracles, that reveal the, the role of Jesus and ultimately his divinity. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Jesus, at one point in John 10, I think it is, he says, you know, if you don't believe me, believe the miracles. Mm-hmm. He wasn't saying the miracles are greater reality. He was saying, listen, if you're struggling with me, look at what I've done because it'll bring you back to me and I'll point you towards the Father. Mm. Mm-hmm. You, you understand the, the mm-hmm. connection there. Mm-hmm. It's like he would direct their attention. It it's almost sounds uh, offensive in Scripture. If you don't believe me, believe yeah. believe the miracle. But yeah. that's what he was saying. He says, look at what's been done. It will direct you back to me. Yes. And I will direct you to the Father because yeah. I'm only doing what I see the Father do. Yeah. And it's the whole reconciliation thing again. He that's was it. always trying to connect people to the Father. That was it. Yeah. He was always trying to bring reconciliation. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, just thinking about John as well. You, you get that weird one where you can have a man born blind who is healed, and yet in, I think it's John 9 there, they're like, mm-hmm. no, we're not sure you're the guy. The parents come in and go, no, no, he's that guy. And <laughs> But we don't want to get in trouble. We don't get kicked out of synagogue, so he can speak for himself. Yeah. But if you don't want to see a miracle, you won't see a miracle at some oh, point. that's true. Or you'll attribute it to the, the, the devil, which is what they ultimately do, yeah. um, is saying that's by the power of the devil. Just this crazy moment of, of, of resistance to a supernatural experience of the Lord. Yeah, you see it in John 12 when the Father spoke 
And part of the crowd said, no, that was thunder. <laughs> Another crowd said, no, that's angels talking yeah, to Jesus. Yeah. It's like it's like one one group thought it was a natural phenomenon. Yeah. Another thought it was supernatural, but it wasn't for them. Yeah. It was for Jesus. Yeah, yeah. And yet Jesus heard the Father clearly. And as you read it further in the chapter, you see they were they were predisposed towards unbelief. They already yeah. had that point of resistance in them. And it was the resistance, I think. Yeah. It was the resistance in their heart that translated the phenomenon into a natural event or impersonal supernatural wow. event. And then John, under the inspiration of the Spirit, years later is kind of saying, I got to tell you this story about a God encounter that in the moment, was interpreted three different ways. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, so sometimes we think, oh, no, that uh, if, when God moves, everybody knows it. Like, no, oh, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it did. <laughs> it would be uh, super convenient. Uh, yeah, I wish. I wish it did. <laughs> it's uh, kind of the tender in heart that I go, that's the Lord. Yeah. You know, that's the Lord in that moment. So that's, we're trying to cultivate that yeah. tenderness. I, you know, just something as simple as, like, I, I have kind of a natural disposition to not believing things, partly being connected to you. I think I was raised with doubt. Like, <laughs> doubt will protect you, Dan. You know, tr- you know, and I'm like, I was raised in the church where it's supposed yeah. to be about faith, but yeah. somehow <laughs> doubt became my baseline protector of truth. Yeah. So it's been a journey to kind of, like, reach for faith right. before I reach for doubt because it, it was just so woven into my Christianity, into right. my upbringing. Right. So I'm trying to hear a miracle story and go, okay, that's— I'm having difficulty believing that. <laughs> but, but this is a trustworthy person, an eyewitness testimony. You know, right, I'm like, right. I'm going to do, I'm a, tell me more, you know. Yeah. And then I'm uh, like, in our environment, like, with somebody say, I've been healed of cancer? We'll, we'll ask, we're like, were you under a doctor's care? And they're like, yes. And I'm like, well, don't leave that out of the story because that, that's that right. that's the intervention right. of the Lord in medicine through somebody who gives their life to medicine or life to cancer research, like, that's beautiful. Yep, I yep. put that in the story too, yep. but but the bigger story is just trying to reach for faith <laughs> instead of doubt as a self protection. Has been a, yeah. a journey I've been on with you that I've, I'm yeah. thankful for because yeah. I think as a raised in Western education, I was raised in the school of doubt, and <laughs> and it's, it, true. it's just the way it, it works. I, I'd be listening to guys in chapel. I'm 19, right? I'm uh, 1920, and I'm like, you're right, you're wrong. These are men or women <laughs> that have spent their whole life on the mission field, and I'm like. 20 thinking, nope, wrong, you're not anointed. I don't even know if I thought of people being anointed. At the, more right or wrong. At 20, I was either right, you're right, right or wrong right. in the Christianity I was raised in. And so when I think about like how, oh, just the arrogance or that parsing up Christianity based yeah. on right or wrong, it was that school of doubt that I was raised in. Yeah. And uh, it's been a journey to kind of like take the best of that you know, like if the emperor's naked, somebody needs to go, the dude has no clothes on. Like there's got to be some people in the environment that'll do that. But but take the the good parts of that because the Lord's given us our minds. But also to say no no I got to reach for faith like the Lord's good He does good things. Yeah. His pe- yeah. He's on the move. Yeah. What is He up to? And um and just to be able to kind of go. So that's when I try to not to go unbelievable or like that's incredible, which means yeah. unbelievable, right? Yeah, At some yeah, level. Yeah, so I'm yeah, like yeah, trying yeah. to be a little bit more even in my first <laughs> words like bless the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> as, I'm to, yeah, as I'm here to yeah as I'm miracle yeah. testimony. Yeah. That's beautiful. <laughs> So do you believe that it's God's will to heal everyone? Is that like Bethel standard teaching or? A <laughs> I, I have to approach that it is. I have to approach that it's always God's will. And, uh, and my lead on that is everybody the Father sent Jesus to, he healed. Everyone who came to Jesus, he healed. Even, even the Syrophoenician woman, the one who would have been disqualified uh, because she wasn't, uh, wasn't a Jew. Yeah. He still was moved by her faith and healed her. So in following him, I have to take that approach. Mm-hmm. I have had two exceptions that I can think of. Yeah. Uh, when I've been praying, uh, one, uh, one lady, as I was praying for, I could tell, you know, when, when you walk... When you walk sensitive to the Holy Spirit, you don't want to grieve, you don't want to quench. You're you're in that, you know, okay. you walk in that road in a relationship with him. I could tell that if I prayed for healing, it would grieve him. Hmm. And and so, so it was a different idea. It wasn't like if, if it's your Lord, if it's your will. Oh, no, or, no. no. So no, it's I, not I like um, having that um, in your prayer or in your thought life. Because in your, th- it's like practical theology, like you approach everybody like, the Lord's going to move right now. Yeah, yeah. And I can't pray if it's your will, because for me, that's a prayer of unbelief. Okay. Because he's already revealed to me it is his will 
in his provision for healing. And personally, I use Isaiah 53, but you can, you know, you can come yeah. at it from many different angles. It's yeah. an aspect of the kingdom, yeah. which is a present reality. Uh, Jesus made provision for it, so I have to, I have to pursue it in that light. Mm-hmm. And then, but in in my really, you know, it's appointed unto man to die. So there yeah. is a point of death, and uh, I, I don't know that that should be the subject now. But uh, yeah. uh, but uh, I remember praying for this lady. I was uh, visiting as it was a mother of one of our staff members, and uh, and I was in. She had been sick for a while, and as I was praying for her, I could tell she's supposed to go home. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. She's supposed to go home. That's an awkward. That's an awkward moment. It, it, it's not as a pastor because we're in those situations yeah. Yeah. often. But to to pray for that is is a bit awkward for me. I mean, I, I don't have the impartation of death, you know. Yes, to, I hope not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but to pray, Father, I, I I just pray that you just fill her with peace and yeah. that and that. In your perfect timing, you would take her home. She went home within, I think, two hours. Wow. She had been sick for a while. So there was something that took place just, I, I don't know. It was more like maybe releasing. You know, the, sometimes people will hold on because of a sense of obligation or whatever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't know how any of that works, so that's that's way above my pay grade. Yeah. But yeah. but there was that, that prayer of blessing and release, and, and the Lord took her home. So it's intriguing to me, though, because you, like, even though if you don't have it, if it's your will, but you do have the I will keep listening to the Holy Spirit's oh, yeah. voice as I'm moving in my prayer for this person. Absolutely. And so it's not quite a formula. Every once in a while, it feels a bit like that. Like, we, we kind of say... Just assume God wants to heal everybody because that was the model of Jesus. And so I think when we're talking to students, we're like, yeah, just have confidence. The Lord wants to to uh, heal everyone. Yes, yes. But you're modeling a little bit of like, so st- have faith, move in confidence, but keep listening. Well, uh, I yes, absolutely. Okay. But but my listening isn't solved. That Is I, it going to happen? I, yes I, or no? <laughs> it's not so I can figure out do they die or do they live. It's, yeah, okay. you know, it's not that. It's I'm listening because what what do you do? Yeah. Because sometimes I'll be praying for somebody and I can tell, oh, they need to forgive someone, mm. and so I won't accuse them. I I, I won't. Do, I say you have unforgiveness. I won't do that. Right. I'll right. I'll just say hey, just out of curiosity. Uh, sometimes this helps us to to mm-hmm. see somebody get healed. Um, can you think of anyone that you need to forgive? And I've had people say, oh yeah. And I said, well, who who would that be? And so they'll 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 tell me. And I I don't ask for great detail because sure. I, I I don't need to embarrass anybody. Mm-hmm. But I say, how about we forgive them? And, and I've seen it time and time again. Wow. They say, okay, and they forgive them, and then they're healed. So I'm listening, not not to see if they live or die. Yeah. Because uh, yeah. I expect them to live. I just want to know what do I what do you want Lord, me to what do? What are you up to? What, yeah. Yeah. What, you know, Jesus, at one point, he just declares the word, go home, your servant is, is, yeah. is alive, he's yeah. well. Uh, to another, uh, you know, uh, go wash in a pool of Siloam. You know, there's different directives at different times. And uh, and I've had moments in, in, a, in, in a, where I've given somebody a direction, uh, somebody who's missing a part of a muscle in their leg. Mm-hmm. And I said, just walk to the back and then come and see me. And by the time they got to the back and came back to see me, it, the, the Lord had... had uh, done that miracle. So there was an action that was needed uh, for faith to be illustrated. Mm -hmm. It wasn't some noble act. You know, I'm not asking some guy to jump on his broken ankle. That's, that's, that's not necessary. That's Mm -hmm. showmanship and we don't need that. Mm -hmm. But what we do need is to give people an action to connect their faith to. And, uh, and and I've seen it time and time again. Uh, it may be the forgiveness issue. It may be uh, just a simple act of some sort. But, uh, but even the forgiveness, but, you don't use it as a formula. Like, no, I, I, it's, no. it's, you're probably sick because you have unforgiveness. No. Like, it, it's not that. No. It's you're listening for the no. leading of the Holy Spirit in that moment. What's the step of growth and transformation for this beloved person that's in front of you? Exactly. How can I help? How can I be part? So exactly. This, this, Je- Jesus didn't use that formula. That's the reason I don't. Yeah. He didn't, he, did, he, didn't, <laughs> no, he didn't have that as a cookie cutter response. Yeah. You know, he didn't have a, a three, four steps that he went through with each person. He, he did different. So I'm just trying to learn that. Yeah. yeah. So is it the role of faith then? Like how is someone not healed because they didn't have enough faith? Is that 
What is that like our standard line? Like you weren't healed because you didn't have enough faith. How does so? What's that relationship of faith? Faith and healing? is faith is an issue. I would never want to downplay it because Jesus honored it. You know when he saw it. You know mm -hmm. he said, "Man, I haven't seen such faith in all of Israel." Yeah. And so um, he would celebrate great faith. But the thing to remember is even when he saw tiny, tiny faith, uh, like the guy who says, "If you can." You know, yeah, when yeah, you question yeah, God's yeah. ability, when, <laughs> if you can, would you heal my son? Uh, Jesus turns the table. He says, if you can believe, all things are possible to those mm -hmm. who believe. So the point is, is that even where there was very small faith, he still brought the miracle, but he would address the level of faith before he did the miracle, I think, to give them access to move stronger in faith. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so, but no, we we don't, we will, discipline's maybe a hard word, but we will correct somebody on our team that ever points to another person and says, you weren't healed because you didn't have faith. Yeah. That's cruel. Yeah. That's just cruel. Absolutely. And the scripture says it's the prayer of faith that heals the sick. Yeah. So it's not the person even who's coming. Sometimes I'll have people come and they say, man, I just don't even have faith for this. And there are times I feel, it's only happened a few times, but there are times I feel the presence of God, the word of the Lord in that moment so strong, I'll tell them, you don't have to have any faith. I have enough for both of us. Mm -hmm. I wish that was the standard, but it's not. It's just rare. It's not, though? No, no. <laughs> I wish. But, it, but I've had it happen. I've had yeah. it happen where I, yeah. I was so confident that God is on this moment. Yeah. That uh, And I know usually when people are evaluating their faith, they come up short always. Yeah. And so they yeah. don't always know how to look for faith in their own life. And so that's why I try to steer them away from it. I say, listen, I'll, I'll, I'll believe for both of us. Yeah. And it's not to turn attention towards me, obviously. Right. But listen, I'll, I'll stand for both of us. And then we'll see a miracle. Yeah. And so we never turn it uh, towards the person I want them to have great faith, of totally. course. We all want to be growing in faith. And, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. But, I, but I'm not going to blame them for the outcome, mm -hmm. you know. We talk about sometimes that faith the Lord, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So yeah. faith's in the equation somewhere. Like yeah. faith needs to be operating at some level. Yeah. But um, we, we talk about just, it might be the prayer, it might be the prayee, it might be the environment. Yeah. And then we've all seen some unusual miracles when there's no faith. Like doesn't feel like we had much faith, doesn't feel like they had much faith, and the Lord moved. So even it's, kind of like demanding it's there doesn't seem to make a ton of sense in, in our practical experience yeah, where the exactly. Lord's moved when neither one expected much to happen. Exactly. <laughs> I, I treat faith like, like I open a jar, whatever was in there just evaporated. So if I go look for faith in me, it's, it's just the wrong direction for me. Yeah. My approach is I can always obey. I can mm. always obey whatever he says. And have confidence in who he is. Exactly. Yeah, I, yeah. I, my obedience is based on who he is. Yeah. He's given me a direction. Put your hand on the blind eye. I can sense that's what I'm supposed to do. Mm -hmm. um, I can always obey. At the end, I can look back and say, that took faith, or it's just raw obedience, or it's just, you know, the bottom line, it's always just the grace of God. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. And I imagine it's a conversation with the Lord, too, because sometimes, I mean, once there's a miracle yeah. happens or it doesn't, it's like, Papa, what what was that about? What what happened there where you're trying to learn? Yeah his ways yeah. in that moment, and then also what the Lord is up to in his multifaceted wisdom of, you know, because yep. we've had folks who don't get healed in that moment, but weeks later, or, yeah. you know, folks healed after eight years of, of, of being prayed for. Yeah. And you're like, Papa, what? Why now? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't ask why, but I want to learn what he's like. Okay, yeah. I don't, I don't need an explanation. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not offended by a process. Mm -hmm. I, I, I stay as far away from that as I possibly can. I don't analyze the situation. Why did this happen now, not before, whatever. I just, I celebrate when it happens. If it doesn't, that's where enduring faith comes in. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I remember I was, in a, I was in a meeting where a gal came up for prayer and I, and I just started to, you know, if we have a default, it's that we lay hands on somebody and pray. Yeah. And I just started to pray. They had arthritis in every joint of their body every part of their body, they were just crippled with pain. And I went to start to put my hand up and I felt so strong, the Holy Spirit said, don't touch them. And then I thought, well, I'll just begin to pray. And he said, don't even pray. He said, just watch. Mm -hmm. And so as I'm standing there talking to the person, I was trying to figure out, what do I do? What do I do, you know? Because there's gotta be some point of, of contact for faith or something, you know? And I felt this, it's a little strange, but I felt this heat on the back of my neck. And I went, 
is the Lord touching your your neck and your, your shoulder area right now? And the lady went, yeah. I said, well, is there any pain left? She goes, no, there's none whatsoever. And then I, I started realizing, oh, the Lord is showing me Literally, I would have a sensation on my body, and I could tell what just got healed. Mm. So he wouldn't allow me to pray. He wouldn't allow me to touch, nor would he allow me to give the command, as Jesus did. Mm -hmm. he, would, he, would, he would give the command. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't allow me to do it. But, I, but he showed me uh, just my arms. I, I could feel this presence of God on my arms. I said, move your arms around. And they did yeah. until it went all the way down their knees and their feet, and they were completely healed. Wow. But it, it's, that, it's, the, it's the willingness it's the willingness to look mm -hmm. dumb, first of all. You know, you, you, yeah. you, mm -hmm. you have to embrace that part. Because sometimes sometimes you're going to think you're hearing from God and you're not. Yeah. And you yeah. own up we to it. We don't perfectly yeah. hear. Yeah. yeah, we own up to it. But other times you do. And it it encourages you in the journey to live with the kind of risk that it takes to see those kinds of miracles. But I didn't pray one prayer, didn't command one thing, mm -hmm. didn't do anything that that I would typically do in that context. And, and they were healed head to toe. Mm -hmm. I want to get back to enduring faith that you mentioned, and yep. but it, it strikes me that what you're saying it has a lot of nuance, and so sometimes when we teach, the nuance isn't there. We, you know, it's God's will to he, uh, God's will to heal everybody. You know, just pray with right. faith, and here we go, and pray for your neighbor. So we'll lead in bold strokes sometimes um, yeah. that uh, that are necessary for people to break into new experiences, or right. sometimes we don't know what the Lord will do in those moments when you just have people turn to the congregation and pray for each other and healing breaks out. So it's a, yep. there's a moment of faith, but you're describing, um, again, not a mechanism or a, a right you're asserting right. every time, but a relationship with the Lord that has beneficial for you and who you're becoming and the person you're praying for. Exactly. That exactly. seems like, like we could probably use some more of that nuance sometimes when yeah. people run into our message a little bit. But again, we don't want to get so nuanced that we, we quit praying with faith or joy yeah. or uh, integrity. So it's a bit of a dance, you know, yeah, when we I do don't, these things. I don't want to create a theology around what didn't happen. Yeah. That's, yeah, yeah. that's a really big deal for yeah. me. Um, my approach to the faith thing is, is I'll tell people, I say, listen, faith brings answers. Enduring faith brings answers with character. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we're in a journey, we're in a process, yeah. and the Lord is building. He's building us. He's not just doing something through us. Yeah. It's not just about the miracle or the deliverance or what, mm -hmm. whatever it might be. It's, it's about people becoming like Christ. Yeah. And yeah. enduring faith is a part of that. A power, you know, the whole uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit for the purpose of power. Power was for the miracle, but it was also for the endurance until the miracle came. Mm -hmm. You see it all through the book of Acts, that both were manifestations. Mm -hmm. And so when the Holy Spirit has his way in us, it's going to be seen through demonstrations of power, faith, purity, lifestyle, but it's all going to be, also gonna be the endurance yeah. until the miracle comes. Yeah. So you've mentioned enduring faith. And you know, as I think about this, like one of the amazing saints of our time has been Johnny Erickson Tata. And, yeah. and um, I remember in the 70s when she had her accident, and she's, for those who don't know, an incredible heart for Jesus. Yes. Got to see her speak about just about two years ago and was just so moved yeah. by the faith yeah. that she moves in and the faith of her husband, who, her caregiver. It was a, a, it was a wonderful experience to see this yeah. saint of the Lord speak. Um, and I think about you know that her situation of not having a breakthrough in healing and just finding the heart of the Lord for her in, in this season as well. And and as I contemplated, like how would Dan, how would you respond? And I'm like, probably not that beautifully, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And she's been super honest about, hey, there's some days I you know hate I hate it all and I want to drive my caregivers away from me and all that. So she's been really transparent about this. But but there's I, I sometimes wonder in that deal of like, I would want to have faith that is enduring, like she's manifesting. Absolutely, I'd also want faith to still have somebody come in and lay hands on me every day or yeah. once a week, you know? I was yeah. trying to figure out how do we mix that beauty of what she's experiencing in the Lord in the midst of her trial <laughs> with our love of breakthrough and our love of the Lord alleviating suffering. Is that, so one of the ways I was kind of doing that was like, okay, I'd want to have faith like today could be the day. It's been 20 years. Yeah. It hasn't happened yet, but today it could be the day. Yeah. But also that, that sort of coping, enduring faith. Is it, how do you? Can't wrap my head around it. Yeah. yeah I, what I want to do is do two things. I want to make sure that I protect the dignity of her moment. Yeah. 
the dignity of her life. She is so illustrating Christ. Oh, I so would beautiful. never want to mm -hmm. say or do anything that would make her or anybody in her condition. I have friends that, I, that I'm ministering to that are in very, very similar uh, uh, condition. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would never want them to somehow feel less than or mm -hmm. that they don't have enough faith or that uh, somehow this is, you know, God's punishment on their life or mm -hmm. uh, that nonsense. I, mm -hmm. I don't want to do that. <clears throat> but I also don't want to create a theology that I don't want to create theology around, around what doesn't happen. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I mean, I, I don't have good exp I don't have explanations at yeah. all. I, yeah. What I do have is a pool of Bethesda. You know, mm -hmm. one guy was healed. Uh, history tells us there could be as many as nine hundred, a thousand people around yeah. that pool. Yeah. There was only one person healed. Does it mean that Jesus rejected the rest? No. Mm -hmm. Jesus wasn't showing us. He was showing us what one person could do that was yielded to the Father. Mm -hmm. he, he was mm -hmm. illustrating that heart to us. And so the Bible celebrates the one yeah. in that moment yeah. without condemning the others. And this kind of a thing, well, I, I've got it in my own family. You know, my son is is such a champion in faith and a champion of so many things, but he's got a, a hearing loss that is, is quite profound. Yep. And he functions so well in life. But I'll come home with testimonies of... of Healing, heal, healing of uh, deaf ears. Uh, he's prayed for the deaf and had yeah. had them yeah. healed, you know. But I, I remember a while back in a staff meeting, I, I was sharing a story about several deaf uh, people that uh, they could hear. And I looked over at my son, and he looked at me, and he said, he mouthed, we're one day closer, Dad. <laughs> I, oh, that just wrecked me. Wow. That, that, he, that he's, he still has been able to protect his heart to not be jaded, you know, after this many years yeah. being prayed for so many times. Yeah, some weird stories too. People putting oh, fingers in his ears yeah, and all this sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we do all kinds of weird things <laughs> as people. But uh, yeah. but yeah, and he's just really protected his heart and he's really a hero to me in so many ways because he's he's made sure to protect his heart, open for the miracle, yeah. and yet he, he's not holding God hostage yeah. to the miracle. Yeah. It's like if you really love me, it's not that sort of thing. That's that's a cruel position yeah. for us to be in and to put him in. Yeah. yeah. So he's Eric's living with that both the breakthrough faith and the coping faith, yeah. the enduring yeah. faith. Yeah. And that these aren't exclusive. Yeah. They they kind of there are situations where they, they live together. Yeah. And like we talk about, even <laughs> folks that have had a breakthrough after thirteen years, I'm praying for you. Like, well, you were wow, you you were living with a lot of coping faith. <laughs> Yeah. Until this breakthrough faith yep. kind of came into the scene and, and reordered your life or reset the picture. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. So let's talk about uh, God's sovereignty and how we understand God's <coughs> sovereignty. Mm -hmm. uh, does he control everything? Is he in charge of everything but doesn't control everything? What, yeah. what are some of the ways you think about that <coughs> and understand Scripture? Pro probably my understanding in this area uh, creates the greatest challenges for me <laughs> in the body of Christ among, among friends. And I have dear friends that we have wonderful conversations again. But my approach uh, is, that, is that God doesn't control everything. He's in charge of everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, the way I'd illustrate it is say, well, okay, you're a parent, or you're in charge of your household, but you're not in control of everything that happens. You know, something, a dish will break, something will happen, somebody will say something that was unkind. Those things aren't because of your influence. They're, 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 they just happen because you have a household of free will. So that's my approach, mm -hmm. is that God is in, he's absolutely sovereign and that he's in charge of everything. But I don't credit him with Hitler. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't credit him with uh, the disasters that take place uh, in the earth, I don't. I don't look at these and go, "Well, this is the plan of God who's devised wickedness so that His glory could be seen." Mm -hmm. For me, that's absolute nonsense. Mm -hmm. And so I look at His at His sovereignty, seen in that He work. He, he's written you and me into a sovereign plan. Mm -hmm. And for 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 example, uh, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is not willing. So is it God's will for people to perish? No. Are they perishing? Yes. Yeah. 
Why? Because there's there's wiggle room in there somewhere yeah. where where we have some measure of influence on the outcome. If if for example we decide, let's just say you and I represented the entire church, we decide we're not going to evangelize one nation. Well, then there's a whole bunch of people that don't come to know Christ. Now, I have friends who would say, "Well, that was God's will." Yeah. I, that I struggle with. I yeah. struggle with that because. Mm -hmm. He has imparted an understanding of his heart and a grace to do what, what he assigned us to do, and that is to go into all the world, preach the gospel. That's our responsibility. And wherever prayer goes into uh, a missions effort and then missionaries go in or evangelists or whatever go into that effort, there's a harvest of souls that you don't get. Yeah. You know, angels yeah. are not assigned to preach the gospel. We are. Mm -hmm. You know, Jesus could do it better himself. He'd just show up, you know, and preach. And angels could do it better, I'm sure. You know, they show up in their yeah. magnificence. Oh, of, of course. But Although they got a lot of static, too, sometimes from people like Samson's parents. or <laughs> <laughs> Gideon. Gideon yeah, gave yeah. a lot of static to the angels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, it, but the point is we've been given the, the assignment. So we've been somehow written into that sovereign plan. Yeah, it's probably, you know, it's probably a, an area that's easiest to, to misunderstand. Mm -hmm. But I can't ignore it. I have to, I, I have to live responsibly. Is the whole point? We, is what scripture you says? You've been. It, we're supposed to live like we have real authority and real responsibility that we'll be held accountable for. So exactly. like that, in some ways, to not live like that uh, is very uh, unscriptural. Yeah, and to blame it on God's sovereignty. Well, it's just yeah. God's will. No. Yeah. No. Well, and and like you said, he's he's transcendent. He's the creator. In him, we live and move and have our being. So, like, if he doesn't want, if he's not uh, in charge of everything, it doesn't happen. It doesn't exist. So, there's a level at where he right. is ultimately responsible for everything that exists because he's the creator. Yes. But if if he's created a system where he's he's empowered other beings other than himself who actually have the ability to make decisions whose whose actions matter on the planet, then in some ways within his sovereignty, he's creating other people who have the capacity to make decisions other than he would make. And I think that's the worldview of scripture. You see a lot of powerful yeah. um, uh, decision makers in the angelic and demonic realm, as well as the human realm as well. And in, in the Lord's sovereignty, uh, sometimes I'll say it to the students, he's so sovereign, he's decided to be in control of what he wants to be and not in control of the things he doesn't want to be. It's good. It's that's good how. Yeah. That's how big he is. Yeah. And yet, um, uh, for his his purposes, he's decided this is the way. Like I'm going to actually empower these beings I've created with real authority. They they're they matter. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, the level of trust uh, in that is just uh, in, incredible in that moment. It is, and we're called co-laborers. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, only the Holy Spirit in us, the grace of God working in us, could qualify me. Yeah to co-labor, to work alongside the Lord. It, it's it's a grace thing. One of the words that I'll, I'll, when I'm talking about this, it's just that God's not omnicausal. In other words, he's omnipotent, he's all-powerful, or, you know, and, and, and um, but he's not the one who's causing everything yes, to happen. Yes. That his, in his, um, the beauty of creation, he's empowered um, these, these people made in his image to, yes. to defile the garden or... <laughs> To abandon exactly. the connection, exactly. you know, um, and and our choices are powerful. And one of, I think it's G.K. Chesterton, he was talking about how the Lord in some ways is, um, he's trying to create people, uh, in, to destroy evil not by destroying people. Yeah. So you can't, you can't destroy evil by destroying creation, but, but God's opted to not do that. Right. But he's trying to destroy evil by creating people who <clears throat> know what it is and don't find it interesting. Excellent. Who don't Excellent. love it. Yeah. And who have learned to love righteousness, yes. justice, and mercy, and walk humbly with the Lord. And so that's like for his purposes um, of who we're becoming, this is the way he's decided to to create, to give human beings and angelic beings authority. Yeah. And yeah. You know, to have our our decisions matter. Yeah, somehow he is he is more glorified by it happening that way. I mean, obviously, everything we're assigned to do, he can do better, quicker, yeah. everything. Yeah. But for some reason, it's been written into the 
into the code that we get to be a part of what he's doing on the earth. I mean, the whole, the whole beginning, uh, Genesis 1, be fruitful, multiply, subdue the earth. He, he, he planted people, humanity, in an adverse climate and told them to bring change. And he's, he's just, he's commissioned us to represent him well. And now because, uh, earlier I mentioned um, uh, Jesus modeled what life could be like with no sin and completely empowered by the Holy Spirit. Now, because I've been forgiven, and the Holy Spirit is in me, it's actually possible to follow the example that Jesus set. So I get to now be a co-laborer in living in purity, mm-hmm. in living in, in, in kindness, affection, love for people, living in power. We get to co-labor with him and demonstrate his authority on the earth. Yeah. And he's glorified through that. I mean, yeah. that, that brings him glory uh, in a way that he wouldn't get otherwise. Yeah. All, all becoming like him in yes. his relationship with him, yep. all yep. to that, to yep. that beautiful end. It's, it, and the thing we, we like to remind uh, the folks here often is that this is a relational journey. It's, it's, not, it's not achievement-centered. It's, it's uh, yeah. um, we, we like outcomes, you know, like we, we say. <laughs> I got to heaven. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we, I, I like the outcome. The person got healed. Yeah. I saved enough money to buy the car. Yeah. You know, it's the outcomes. He likes the journey. Yeah. He, likes, he likes the moment that uh, I couldn't sleep, so I got up and prayed. Mm. You know, mm-hmm. he, he likes the journey where I didn't know what to do, so I just poured over the scripture for insight and what his heart was, his mind was. He values the journey. And he rewards me with the outcome. Beautiful. Yeah. That's good. So um, one of the uh, scripture translations that you like to read out of is the Passion Bible. You know, causes some um, concern for some. And, mm-hmm. and um, I, I'm aware that over our time together, you know, it, it, you used to read out of the message pretty regularly. I know you switched translations at some point because you used to be new, more of a New American Standard guy. And then yeah. you went to the New King James. Yeah. I, I think because you just had were so familiar with the New American Standard yeah. that you were wanting to like read it afresh. And then, uh, you know, uh, so you, you've you been reading lots of different translations for a long oh, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I, I like different translations. I only teach out of, new, or, or my books, I only teach uh, or write out of New American Standard or the New King James. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I, they're more word-for-word I just, translations? I'm, I'm more familiar with them. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I... I I'm not a Hebrew or Greek. Yeah. Greek. I have to believe whoever Me it is. Let's you know? be clear. Yeah, I know. Yeah. We're, we're beholden to <laughs> super smart Christians yeah, I, who have done this for us. Exactly. So I, 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 I honor the scholarship that has gone into uh, the New King James, the New American Standard I love. Yeah. And often I, when I'm quoting Scripture, I will quote out of my years in the New American Standard. Yeah. So anyway, when I teach, I teach generally out of those. But for inspiration, oftentimes I will read, I love the Passion Translation. Yeah. There are so many things. Every time he he deviates from what would be a traditional approach to a verse, yeah. he explains it so par- powerfully that, that even if you don't agree with him, you at least understand where he's coming mm-hmm. from, which mm-hmm. I really enjoy that part of the process. Yeah. Um, but I don't use it as a... As um, as a proof text for something, yeah. But yes. I, but I will. Uh, I don't apologize for it. I, I love to use it. Yeah. But I, I use it for really for passion for inspiration. <laughs> he, it basically says what he's trying to do. And every Bible has an agenda, and he's been super clear with his. It's like I want you to experience exactly, the exactly. passion God has for you. That's it. And that He's awakening in you. And I've purposely kind of chosen literary language that can do that yeah. powerfully. Yeah, um, the, the message d- did that. In, oh, like, in totally. I mean, some of, the, some of the, the things that he said were, they were so different <laughs> than what I read here, but they were so profound yeah. that it, it was almost like his translation, if you will, yeah. was a commentary in a sense. It explained things that just made it clear. Absolutely. Yeah, and Both I, Eugene Peterson and yeah. the Passion, I, I treat them like commentaries or read them devotionally because they exactly. do unlock like, whoa, exactly. I've never quite seen that. Yeah. And the Phillips translation is another one. I used yeah. to love the Phillips, J.B. Phillips. Yeah, absolutely. For the same reason. Yeah. I, I grew up with that one. That was the only one, you know, Yeah, there were very few. The we've always had these single-person <laughs> translations. It's just so funny that people just get wigged out about them at, at yeah, some point. Yeah. At the church at various times gets so frustrated and yeah. concerned about various uh, translations. But, hey, go look at your church history. There's been lots of trans uh, translations yeah, over yeah, yeah. time. All to meet the needs of the community. 
uh, you know, sometimes they had new translations because, you know, the Church of England was splitting from the, uh, you know, the rest <laughs> of the church needed a translation. Uh, other times it was from the Latin, and then it was from the Greek and the Hebrew. So, right, right. Um, you know, the King, New King James that some people just are fanatical about was actually a response to a need and yeah. a, a had its critics in its day at the very beginning. Like, I, you know, one of the scholars that was a popular at the time said, I demand that it should be burnt, and I won't use it. So that was the critique <laughs> of the New King James. So we kind of live in this odd fantasy, like there's just one or two yeah. really great yeah. translations, and we've been using a lot of different ones for a long time. Yeah, you know. I like them. Yeah. I like them. I we had the, the Living Translation, beautifully yeah. powerful. Again, it was a paraphrase. The, it wasn't a translation. The original Living was a paraphrase. Right. It, Kenneth Taylor took the English and just made it more, it kind of updated it, as I understand it. Yeah. And then, uh, but then the Living Bible was actually translated more from the from the Greek and the Hebrew at some point. And that's the difference between the paraphrase and the translation. But again, you in the Jesus movement, you saw how powerful the Living Bible was for getting people totally. into their word. Totally. And... Um, uh, and he, people were very critical of that, uh, critical of him yeah. in that day. And it's just like this critical spirit, it, it ain't pretty, it ain't helpful. And it's been around for yeah. uh, forever. And when we join it, we're not helping anybody. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just, and, the, and the people who, who, who criticize the translations are usually very well educated, which isn't a yeah, criticism, yeah, yeah, yeah. but they can read the harder translations easier. Where you've got this brand new believer, yeah. they don't understand hither and thither and these yeah. and thous, which was what you had an option for in my day. It was yeah. good news for modern man or, yeah. or or King James, you know, until the new American standard came along. And it was in the seventies. And so yeah. you just had you had some rough yeah. choices, you know. Yeah. And you get these brand new believers, they don't understand this stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I'll never forget um, there's this new century translation that they actually uh, marketed as a children's version as well because it's written as at, at a third grade reading level. Yeah. Yeah. So I remember taking my son Eric and, uh, into the Christian bookstore uh, one day. We walked in and I wanted to find this because I had read about it. I found this translation in a children's version. I opened to Galatians 2 verse 20. It's no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me. So mm -hmm. I took this verse. I said, Eric, read that. So I, I forget, he's, he's probably seven, eight years old. So he reads this verse, and his eyes went wide, and he looked up at me and he said, Dad, I understand that, wow. which wow. just told me everything I've had him read, he didn't understand. Wow. And now it was written at a third grade reading level that, that he could connect with. Well, that's what we want, is we want yeah. people to join in the, Absolutely. you know, I can read harder things now than I could, yeah. you know, when I first when I first surrendered to Christ. But but, uh, but I, I don't want what I'm capable of doing to be my judgment against somebody else. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, and I think for us as well, we preach and teach generally, you know, out of the New American Standard, the ESV, the New King James. Mm -hmm. And when I'm teaching preaching classes, that's what I'm doing. But I'm like, hey, if you want to read the message, uh, you know, you want to uh, look at the passion to understand another brother in Christ's take on that, then that might be super helpful for yeah, you to, like, look yeah, at. Yeah. And we all translations, if you, you know, are uh, on this continuum, maybe either word for word or thought for thought. And some are more successful than others. And even within translations, some verse translations are more successful than others. Yeah, uh, So it's, it, it, again, if we can find the heart of a real value for each other and artistry and beauty and transformation yeah. <laughs> and less of the critical spirit and yeah. anxiety, like that anxiety, like I said, it's been around for at least you know, since uh, the 1400s or something, 1500s, this anxiety around translations. Now, it's the living word of God, absolutely, but we yes. don't even have the original autographs of it. We have copies of copies of copies. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit's been brooding over those to give them to the church. And they're yeah. brooding over Christians who are translating them uh, in, in light of new archaeological discoveries as well. And so we're just on this journey of the Lord yeah. giving us the scripture he wants to create the sort of church that he wants and um, yeah. I think he's a genius the way he's done it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. I, you know, the thing I have greater problem with is that this book is being taught by people who aren't in love. Mm -hmm. They may be scholars, but they don't have the relationship to really add the nuance that, that this thing needs. Yeah. This is a living book. It's not just, uh, it's not just a textbook. 
This is, I, I, I tell our students, as you know, I said, this is Jesus in print. Mm -hmm. He is the word of God. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we don't tell me you love Jesus and you don't love the word. Wow. Don't tell me you love Jesus. You don't love the scriptures. Yeah. Yeah. You know, our, our, our approach is, you know, I, I liken this to a recipe. Um, not everything in a given recipe for a meal, mm -hmm. not everything in the recipe tastes good. Mm -hmm. Some things yeah. actually taste horrible. Baking soda. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, well, <laughs> but you put it unsalted in. Unsalted butter. But go ahead. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I'm, I'm with I can you. go on. I'm, I'm with you. I know you could. <laughs> But in the whole, in the whole meal, it's it adds a piece that is brilliant. Mm -hmm. So I look at judges and I look at the genealogies and I look at all the unique parts of this word. I need all of them. I need every single part because together, it creates the perfect meal, the perf perfect recipe that represents him well. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And and to to your point, Jesus one of his main arguments with the Pharisees was like, you you guys understand the Old Testament but you don't understand the Old Testament. <laughs> yeah. And so, so there's that, yeah. that we have to like soberly look at that ability to master material and not be mastered by the material or you yeah. know, by the master. Yeah. And, and one of his points was, if you really knew this, you would have recognized me. Yeah. And you didn't. Yeah. Absolutely. Because this led to me, you know, and, and that was the lesson. Yeah. Absolutely. So when I, do you think it translates? Like, so when I'm steeped in the word and my relationship with the Lord, I can actually look at another believer and go, I don't love exactly how he's interpreting that scripture or translating it, but I see the love of Christ in him. I see the, the yeah. trust of the father in yeah. her, her. And so I can super, like, like, I don't agree with the interpretation. I love the individual. Exactly. That, and that happens all the time. I mean, I, I, I'm in such diverse groups that I hear teachings that, you know, uh, maybe three quarters of it I, I really have issue with. But what I'll do is, and I, I, was, I really learned from my dad's example, I'll look for the quarter yeah. that speaks to my heart and I'll champion it and I'll thank them for that, for that word, you know. And, and uh, it, that's back to the issue of valuing diversity mm -hmm. and, uh, and celebrating the fact that we are unique and none of us have it all together. And I'm going to treat you kindly because I want to be treated kindly. Yeah. I realize I don't have... you use, it'll be measured exactly, to you. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And, and that's huge, yeah. So you and I are followers of Jesus, gave our hearts to Jesus years ago. Let's just quickly tell that story. Um, uh, I'll tell mine. I, I remember my mom and dad caught, got reintroduced to the Lord uh, through uh, the tragedy of the death of my older brother. He was eight at the time. I was four. Mm -hmm. A local church pastor went to minister to them, and then we just kind of got swallowed up in this wonderful community in the wow. Bay Area and was kind of raised in that community. Yeah. And my, my mom was, um, they, it was, uh, they taught her, they gave her the curriculum and said, hey, listen, go do a good news club for the neighborhood kids. And so... Um, she would teach them at Tanya's house, and Tanya would teach them at our house. And so I'm in the I'm in the my own living room with um, Julie and Tommy and Kenny. You know, all my yeah, neighborhood yeah, kids there, yeah. and we're singing you know songs somewhere in outer space. God has prepared a place. So yeah, yeah, I remember yeah. the the songs yeah. in the '70s. Yeah. And uh, they, they, I think, presented the wordless book. You know, it was very simple. Like the the, the wordless book was a yellow page, heaven, God wants you to go there. Black page, uh, that you're sinful, you can't. Red page, the blood of Jesus will set you, change your black heart to white page, pure hearted, yeah. and then you can go live on the yellow page, you know, with the Lord <laughs> at some level. So I'm four years old, and this is Gospel Light publishing this, this simple expression of the gospel that's based on heaven, getting, getting to heaven, and having your sin right, forgiven. Right. But I remember being four, and it's like, who'd like to give your heart to Jesus? And I'm like, I do. So I'm, I remember giving my heart to the Lord there, and, yep. and um, uh, it was a serious moment for me when I you know, still remember vaguely, you know, like childhood memories at some level. I remember everybody else went in the kitchen, but for some reason I felt led to go to my own bedroom and to That's talk beautiful. to the Lord there in that moment. And of course I didn't know everything that was happening in that moment. You know, I think no Christian does, right? When you give your heart to the Lord, he's like, Great, let's get on with this. Yeah. But uh, but it but that was my moment, and you know probably like other kids gave my heart to the Lord at, at camp through the years. But but I right, that was right, my time right. with the Lord, um, and so I you know I know that I know that I know that I've been walking with Jesus for fifty years. Like it's yeah. super clear to me. Well, what's your time when that, you gave your heart to Jesus? A phrase that's actually not in Scripture, but it functions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does. But it does. It, I, I think it's not in Scripture. But anyway, go ahead. It's close enough. Yeah. 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 
Um, I was raised in church, so mm -hmm. I, I was raised around that. And I just remember back in the prayer room, you know, behind the, uh, the platform was a prayer room. I remember going in there and praying and, mm -hmm. and asking Jesus to come into my life. I think I was six six years old, I remember telling my parents what I did and mm -hmm. and all. I, I, I remember also uh, when I was 18 years old, I started hearing uh, some preaching that was very wonderful and powerful, but it was this no compromise, all in for Jesus. I never would have thought or said anything other than that, but I could tell that the people I was with had a greater passion for God than I did. And I knew I needed, I didn't have the passion, the fervency for Christ. Mm -hmm. I didn't have that kind of a hunger, and I knew it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and through that preaching, I I said yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it was it was an all in, yeah. you know, all in. You, I don't care if I ever own anything. I don't care if I ever yeah. accomplish anything. All my dreams, everything I lay down at your feet. All I want to do is honor you with my life. Yeah. And it was it was just one of those m moments that was all in. Yes, and I yeah. was the complacent guy in the sitting in the you know towards the back of the church, just waiting for it to get over so I could hang out with my friends, yeah. and uh, and that it was a Saturday night that I that I made that commitment to the Lord. <clears throat> Sunday morning, you know, not that where you sit in the church matters, but for me it mattered. I, yeah. I was in like the second row. I had my Bible open. I'm wow. ready to take mm -hmm. notes. Everything changed in in one night. Wow! I hated to read. I began to devour. Uh, the Word of God, I began to devour books. I remember reading a book and being so impacted by it. And I thought, I, uh, I read this book, Normal Christian Life by Watchman Nee. Mm -hmm. I read this book and I went, he got that out of the Bible. I need to read the Bible. <laughs> and it actually, it didn't, it didn't yeah. make me separate from Scripture to read books. It actually propelled me into the Word Interesting. to yeah, study yeah. the Word of God. Yeah. yeah. And I, I literally, I became a student as, as good as I could become a student. Yeah. I became a student overnight when I when I wasn't one before. And and that's how it happened. That's yeah. how it happened for me. It was an absolute So like around. a childhood experience of being in the family, but then a, another uh, experience of yeah. really being kind of set apart to the things of the Lord. And I think a lot of us raised in the church would have seminal moments, often, you know, tied to I mean, epic retreats or speakers sure, or sure. meetings at some level where you're yeah. just like, okay, I'm, I'm really going to get serious yeah. about the Lord yeah. in those moments. So that, yeah. so our our understanding of the cross and how people become Christians is, I think, very evangelical. We believe Absolutely. in a personal salvation. Jesus, you know, uh, is our personal Savior. Um, yeah. We invite people to be, you know, forgive their, be forgiven of their sins, to believe Jesus is who he says he was and accomplished yeah. what he said he would accomplish in the cross and then to follow him for the rest of their lives as yeah. Lord and Savior. Like, right? That's what that's, that's what I do. That's what yeah. you do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know it is. It's it's there is no other way to the Father but through Jesus. Absolutely. I mean, it's it is the sacrifice of Jesus of his own life. Yeah. His own shedding of blood. Absolutely. That washes away sin, but also destroys the power of sin. Yeah. And in his resurrection makes it possible for us to be born again. There is no other way. Yeah. I, I tell our folks, I say, listen, if there's another way to God, then he was cruel in requiring Jesus to suffer on the cross. Mm -hmm. If there's mm -hmm. dozens of ways, no, yeah. there is not. It's it's the only way. It's the only reason he would have required his son to do what he did is because it was the only solution. Yeah. Anybody and ever saved from sin is saved because of the death of Jesus on the cross and absolutely, his resurrection. Absolutely. Yeah. So this is, it feels odd sometimes because people think that we don't believe this. It's always the most, what? What is the internet upset about now? Or, you know, what is, <laughs> what are they saying about us now? It strikes me so weird. I'm like, I don't understand. Now, partly it's because we, uh, the church I was raised in, you had an altar call at the end of every service. Yeah. We never moved to ministry time because we didn't have ministry teams. And we only had one deal. And it didn't matter if you're preaching on how to raise Christian kids, you were going to end with an altar call. Right, right. It uh, was a little bit of how, it didn't, it wasn't every Sunday, but that was the tradition, I think, in the 70s and the 80s. Because yeah. that's what you did at the yeah. end of a service. And um, so we... We've had seasons. We've you know we've been together since '95 or so. We've had seasons of more mm -hmm. emphasizing altar calls or, or or not emphasizing an encounter with the Holy Spirit or some sort of ministry or right. pro prophecy or healing or various things. Um, so I, I can understand why sometimes people are like, "Well, you guys don't do an altar call at the end of every message." You're like, "No, because we, we don't have a sense." We're trying to follow what the Holy Spirit's doing with that message, 
And an altar call might not be the thing, or it might be the thing. What? Yeah, that's been the standard. I've tried to practice for 40-some years yeah. is, is if if we have a room filled with unbelievers, I want to have an altar call. Yeah. But if I'm— if it's a meeting for the saints, then I want to teach and train for the believers. Yeah. For, for the believer, yeah. now things are so diverse that, as I'm sure you mm-hmm. you would say, in the last year or so, I don't know that we've had a, a Sunday that we've not given an altar call. Right. Right. Simply because we're we're just recognizing that the hearts of the nations really are opening yeah. to Christ and through. Uh, media through the people that our own folks are bringing uh, into the room. They'll bring their neighbor or whatever. Uh, we, we've we not yet made our Sunday morning service purely evangelistic. We still make it a teaching time for the believer. Yes. But but by and large, we end with an altar call, a, people, a chance for people to receive Christ, but also a chance for people to get healed. That's also part of yes. the gospel. Yeah. Or to to receive prayer for another matter that they have going on in their life. So our altar calls have two parts to them. One is for people to come to Christ, but also that people would be able to come and receive ministry for whatever they have going on in their life that seems to be broken. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. For us, you know, the cross is, we, and I think as one of the authors called it the hinge of history. I mean, it's mm-hmm. uh, everything revolves around yes, this. Absolutely. And and, um, and that uh, Christ's ministry and his death and resurrection and his message, they go hand in hand, yes. not one higher than the other. Absolutely super important. And uh, we we do feel like um, partly, though, maybe we don't end in an altar call all the time, although we're kind of trying to do that more often. Mm-hmm. Uh, evangelism has been a huge part of who we are for a long time. We believe in, you know, apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, and that we yeah. have evangelists on our staff. And then also that every person is supposed to do the work of an evangelist as well. Yes. Be, be prepared to give a reason for the hope that you have, right. Right. Uh, but do so with gentleness, you know, um, um, in the scripture. Um so let's talk about how, like, one of the ways that we think, because the Lord's gift, given us this gift of being a worshiping house, um, that we get the opportunity to write songs about um, his death and resurrection, about the impact of the cross, and we get this chance to sing songs about the this being the center of our existence, our relationship with Jesus, which yes, is which yes. happened through the cross, being the center. So partly, would you say it's it's part of our understanding of theology that we sing the gospel over ourselves, like every Sunday. Uh, I believe that's true. You know, I our uh, our our teams of, of writers and musicians, uh, without being exhorted to, they have mm-hmm. been fine tuning their understanding of the cross and the resurrection and the life of purity and passion for God and all these things, obedience and purity of lifestyle and all these stuff, all these things that would be important to just about any church in in, in the mm-hmm. nations. Um, they've been writing about it more and more, more intentionally, yeah. and it's been so encouraging to me, because you know you've got uh, you've got uh, Charles Wesley and Jonathan West- Wesley. You know you've got the the preacher and you have the musician. Yeah. You, you have the musician who who put the theology into music, and part of the reason they did that, as I'm sure you know, that they would they would write the theology into music because it helped people to remember it. Yes. If if there's music with it, you remember it longer. Oh, I'll hear my kids singing the gospel in my house. It's just it's wonderful. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> it just helps you to remember. Yeah. And so that's part of what our teams are doing. I actually told our musicians several years ago. I said, "What do you want the church to look like in five years? Mm-hmm. Write a song about it now, mm-hmm. and we'll sing our way into it." Beautiful. Yeah. So, is part of it. Um, Maybe that we don't talk about sin as much because lots of times those messages kind of go hand in hand, even to the right, church. Like, right. hey, you guys are Christians, but you're still full of sin. Like, just think about what you did this past week. You better get to the cross again. <laughs> right, right. Um, do you do you think that's part of like maybe the message of some of the churches in America that is different than our message, or uh, sometimes what? It's it's awkward to even hear that as a statement because so much <laughs> of our one on one conversations with people is, yeah. you know, knock this off here. Let me help you get out of this. You're too great for that kind of lifestyle or whatever. Yeah. And we do a lot of correction I mean, about, uh, oh, you know, about even self correction and peer to peer. Yeah, yeah, yeah uh, among ourselves. I mean, yeah. we're we're very focused on living righteously and purely. When we come together, though, I will admit. There is a bent towards celebrating, celebration mm. of who he is, who he's made us to be, and the privilege that we have to be together. And that is a prevailing theme. 
I don't ever want that to change, regardless of how much we may need to talk about sin Interesting, yeah. in, in one situation. And that's a conscious decision on my part. So if I, you're used to coming to church and hearing about sin, that doesn't happen at Bethel a ton. You hear about Jesus and yeah. what the cross has accomplished yeah. rather than like our failings during the week or or – yeah, well, I mean, we make reference to it. You know, yeah, we yeah. give altar call for people to come and yeah. get, you know, some of the guys will have, uh, you know, come get free from pornography or yeah. whatever addiction yeah. you may have. And we do that all the time. You know, that, that happens a lot. But it's not the focus. The focus is on him. Yeah. And I, I don't feel bad for that. Um, I think we can get better on altar calls. I mm -hmm. do. It's why this last year I've told our, our teams, you know, someone will be speaking on Sunday morning and I'll say, make sure you leave room at the end to give an altar call yeah, because yeah. I, I just feel like it's really a time mm -hmm. of harvest. It always has been. Yeah. But I can I can feel it in my heart that the Lord is saying, you've, you've got to keep the one in mind, not just the 99. You've got to keep the one mm -hmm. in mind. And so and so we're becoming more proactive, more intentional. Yeah. Well, in while that. still probably being not, not – Overly sin conscious, but uh, we, we try to in the school ministry with our new identity, our identity in Christ. It's like, hey, you're a new creation. Like, yep. whatever that that sin that's holding on to you, that's something to be entangled that you should be thrown off. Yep. That's not your realest you. That's not your deepest you. You're a new creation. Yep. And so we do try to have, I think, encourage people's faith in their identity in Christ, His grace. You know, Christ in me, the hope of glory. Uh, more than in um, conscious of our own sin. I mean, that probably would be true of the way we teach identity as well. No, that's that's exactly right. That's mm -hmm. exactly right. I I don't feel like we shy away mm -hmm. from dealing with sin. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I you know I know how we live throughout the week and working with people in classes and all this stuff, our Sunday services, yeah. etc. Yeah. We don't shy away. We don't condone. Yeah. I don't ever say, oh, this is okay. No, it's not okay. But, but what we want to do is, is we want to make sure you understand who he is and what he's done for you. And so that's going to be the emphasis. And that has been intentional on my part for mm -hmm. quite a few years because I, I found you get what you teach. And so if you teach a lot about sin, you, you create a consciousness <laughs> yeah. of that bent towards sin in people. And it's not healthy. No. I, 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 don't, you know, I don't want to pretend, no. but I also want to build. Listen, the reality is... You've given your life to Christ. You are truly born again. In your heart of hearts, you have a desire to please him. Mm -hmm. It is your nature to honor him. That's what I want to address when I'm talking to people. Yeah. And I, I've even done that. I, I remember uh, marriage counseling with this couple that was really uh, older in years and really in a rough place. <laughs> and uh, But I knew they were both born again. I said, listen, I am. this is how I started the meeting. I said, I am meeting with you because I believe you're born again. And if you're truly born again, in your heart of hearts, you want to do whatever's right. I'm meeting with you because of that. Wow. And, yeah. uh, and then we work from there. So, so the, the point is, is I want to make people not ignorant of sin, not ignorant yeah. of the devil's devices, but I want them to live conscious of him. But you've had a journey, I think, in your own, like when you were more sin conscious than when you became conscious of all Christ had done and was doing. Yeah. And, and that... It's horrible. Sin consciousness wasn't... Ideal for your spiritual growth. <laughs> no, no, it's not. It leads to guilt, shame. It leads to all the stuff you yeah. can't fix. Yeah, it leads to all, it, it leads to deep introspection, not not the reflective kind that leads you yeah, to repent, but the healthy but the, kind. Yeah, but you know, I, I I ask a crowd of people. I say, how many of you have gone deeply introspective? They all raise their hand. I say, how many of you came out encouraged? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> nobody nobody raises their hand because that's yeah. where we come out just feeling so horrible yeah. about ourselves yeah. and. And I, I don't want to leave it, live in a pretend world and pretend no, things right. are well when they're not. I, I want to be upfront and honest. But but building a sin consciousness does not lead to life. It's yeah. it's Christ consciousness yeah. that changes me. Being fascinated with him and what he's done Absolutely. is way more helpful oh, than goodness. being uh, highly aware of what the enemy's done. Yeah, uh, I couldn't live the other way. I mean, I tried. I was mm -hmm. I dealt with the guilt and the shame so much. I mean, it's silly now as I look back, but I— I actually, I'd feel so bad. I'd confess sins I never committed just in case they crossed my mind, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. because you're so conscious of your unworthiness. Well, at yeah. some point, you've got to believe you're forgiven. Yeah. And Beautiful. when you do it, you have to change your identity. And I think one other thing for me is, is coming uh, from that wordless book, you know, where the story started with you got to get to heaven. But you have a black heart. Yeah. But Jesus' blood gives you a white heart. Like that, and that's beautiful. Like I, that's nothing wrong with that. Yep. But we do 
talk about how um, heaven becomes a place to arrive at and get to instead of it's the very presence of God. Yeah. And so this, this theology of the kingdom does kind of say, um, and I want to get to Eucharist as well, because like, I don't want to forget that, that the, in okay. the communion, yep. we come and again hold the sufferings of Christ in our hand. Let's go there, because I know that you okay. you take communion personally quite a bit, but yep. Jesus taught us, not, don't get too far away from my sacrifice. Like You're going yeah. to come back to my broken body and my blood pretty regularly. Exactly. This is important for you. Stay connected to this. So. How does that function for yeah, you? About, as far as we don't feel like we're getting close, far from the gospel because we're regularly here having communion. It's part of the rhythm of our community. So yeah. like, what? <laughs> it was, it's the Lamb of God on the throne. Yeah. yeah. So forever there's that reference point. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, communion is a huge part of, of church life in yeah. general. Yeah. Uh, for us, for me, it's something I took again this morning and Yesterday and I, I most every day I, I take communion, come before the Lord and honor Him for His absolute love for us as people. His self-giving love. Yeah, yeah, that He would sacrifice Himself. I, I, I just I, I literally just go through this before Him and say, God, you became empty so that I could be full. You were broken, so I could be whole. You were rejected, so I could be accepted. You were despised so I could be celebrated. You became poor that I could be rich. You became sin so that I could become righteousness. And just regularly just rehearse these things that he became all of that so that I could have life. Yeah. I, I didn't earn any of it. It's all a gift. And so when I take that broken body, I just I remind myself of the, of the price that he paid so that we could have life, yeah. that we could receive simple faith and what he did on my behalf that gives me eternal life. Yeah. And, uh, and it's important for me to rehearse that on a, on a regular basis. And so I, I pray the broken body, of course, uh, represents many things. But for once, by his stripes we are healed. So I, I pray for that healing grace to be released to people that I know that are mm -hmm. suffering. And then I hold the cup before him. And I, I proclaim, as for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. And I, I began to pray for family members. I pray for those who, who would aggressively oppose me in the gospel. And I, and I honestly, uh, with heartfelt affection, pray for the blessing of the Lord on their lives as well. And it's, it's just a, it's an important part of, of my life. Uh, so the Eucharist, the communion, is so central. Uh, this this yes. practice the Lord's given us. It, for us, it sits within this kingdom, but and the kingdom's about His presence. It started yes. in His yeah. presence in the garden. And then uh, it, it'll end in his presence. Heaven is his presence. Yes. It's not so much a place, it's a person to be exactly. in this, the, this relationship <clears throat> with the Lord. But sometimes I think we the cross is a component of the Lord's kingdom uh, in the way we talk about it. And that might be confusing sometimes. It's like because it's not all the cross and then getting to heaven, it's actually the cross heals humanity and then the kingdom is born and more invited to become like God in relationship with, with the Lord. So I sometimes wonder if if uh, it feels like the cross is in center because we have this larger story of the kingdom of God before and then the kingdom of God to come, that the cross is the way into. Do you want to speak about that real quickly? or? Yeah, the, here's another challenging thing to understand and mm -hmm. to articulate well so that so that we, we represent him. So we well. never minimize the cross uh, oh, in goodness. this discussion. It's central. Yeah. It's yeah. central, but it doesn't end at the cross. Yeah. You know, the whole, the whole point that I make, I hope I make it well, mm -hmm. is that the Christian life technically isn't the cross, it's the, it's the resurrection. Mm -hmm. But you don't get there without the cross. The cross yeah. is absolutely central. It's, yeah. it's you can't raise, you know, Jesus didn't raise himself from the dead. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't <laughs> die and then raise yourself yeah. to demonstrate something. It's the complete abandonment to the will of God. And it's the resurrection life and presence of God that comes and enables us to live by grace in a way that represents Jesus well. So you can't separate the two. Yeah. And I'm okay, I'm living in resurrection power in this, but tomorrow I'm still gonna have to die again to this situation <laughs> or to that. I'm gonna have to deny my flesh in this or you know, whatever it might be. It's it's the continuous cycle mm -hmm. of of truly bearing up our cross, following after Jesus, but knowing it leads to something. Here's my concern. 
as, as I was raised in an environment, that, not with my dad, but in various teachers, that they would emphasize the cross, but it became morbid because there was never a resurrection. Mm. It, it mm-hmm. never led to anything. Yeah. It only led to you can't do that. You can't become that. You can't dream that. Uh, all your dreams, desires are of the flesh. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it ended wow. the expression of human uh, uniqueness mm-hmm. that God actually wanted to, to bring out. You know, John, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John each have the fingerprints of those four men in those four Gospels. God wasn't afraid to have their personalities demonstrated because he values us. He doesn't want to do it without us. He wants to include us in the journey. And so here we are. I've I've just wanted to make sure that, yes, we emphasize the cross. The cross is central. But my goodness, it's got to lead to something. Mm -hmm. There's got to be that this experience of laying down my life has led me into a place where I can represent him better Mm -hmm. through purity, through power, through my love for people. There's got to be resurrection. And we don't leave it in the rearview mirror like we're driving away from it. It's actually we through the Eucharist, through through the singing of it, through our own devotional life, we live connected to his self-giving love in the cross every day as we're moving and advancing yeah. the kingdom. Yeah. As the best as we know how. As best we know yeah. how. Yeah, yeah. we'll, we'll get to heaven and figure out, well, we could have done that better. <laughs> yeah. No doubt. No doubt. <laughs> yeah, I've enjoyed our time. It's been super fun. Yeah, and uh, let's do it Thanks. again. All right. Yeah. All right.